Welcome home. If you don't know me, I'm Josie Collier, your class president, your class association uh, president, alumni association president, excuse me. Aaron is the class president. I am fortunate enough to open this ceremony and welcome you all back after a very long time. Um, I am also very, very fortunate to welcome Will, but before I do that, I wanna tell you a little bit about why we're here. So a Hallmark event at any Hamilton reunion weekend is what we're doing right now. We're gonna take a step back in time and we're gonna hear what it was like 50 years ago from someone who was here. It's an experience of history. It's an experience, hopefully, of humor. Um, it's a tale of hijinks but it's also a tale of gathering amongst friends, family, and loved ones in a way in which we wouldn't necessarily know about unless you hear it from the person themselves. And while I would love to talk about more about John, and, but I don't know him, so <laughs> I'm gonna introduce Will, who knows a little bit more about him, and he can tell you all the cool things about John. I was gonna say his last name properly, and then Pederessi. <laughs> class of 1970. So Will Everhart, class of 70, come introduce your friend. Thanks, Josie. So I met John in speech class in our freshman year in 1966. And I've known him ever since, and he and I became fraternity brothers and good friends over the years. He played football, I didn't. <laughs> he played lacrosse. I didn't do that either. But we were both fraternity brothers, and we're brothers in many other ways. So please welcome my dear friend, John Pitaresi. Thank you, Will. Um, this, um, I've been here for many of these uh, class analyst letters over the years. Um, so um, this is, is a great, great honor. Uh, it's, it's also very intimidating. But before I, I get into the actual letter, I, I just want to clean up a couple of things. Um, one, if I don't mention your name, please don't be offended, OK? <laughs> Um, and I know people have been in, in, in the past. Uh, doesn't mean I don't like you or didn't like you or whatever. Um, there are um, um, a couple of things um, um, I ne maybe neglected. As, as this, by the way, speech was three years in the making. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> it was actually completed probably two years ago and you've gone through certainly dozens of revisions and edits. Oh, that's another thing. Ronnie Roth, class of 72, edited this. Uh, that's what he does for a living, or did for a living. And uh, so if there are any errors, he's the guy, OK? <laughs> uh, so, um, but he did, he did a great, great job. And um, I accepted and corrected every one of his uh, corrections and suggestions. So he, he's really good at what he does. Um, also, I, I think um, there's a couple sports teams in here that I probably gave short shrift to. One is the, um, uh, the soccer team, which had several very good seasons while we were in school. And uh, Ted Sweeta and Ting Ui from our class were uh, uh, key members of, of that team. So I want to mention them. And uh, also, and I think I do mention this, but the swim teams when we were here were 35-4-1 in the, the four years, and Eric and Kyle swim team. And uh, so um, Will Smithias and Dick Cohen uh, were members uh, of that, uh, that team and um, uh, during those four years. And I'm not sure about any other guys in our class, and I apologize if, uh, so I, I, I wanted to get that out, out of the way. Um, pardon me? Don Youngkin, yes, thank you. Um, and then, uh, uh, I guess I got picked to do this because uh, one, uh, I'm, 
was a reporter for all my career, and two, I had a reputation for uh, being a long-winded storyteller. Um, <laughs> so I, I hope I'm not going to be all that long-winded, but if I, if I am, I hope it's uh, entertaining. But I, I have to tell you, there's at least one person here, and I think two, uh, Steve Wolf, class of 72, and uh, Dick Patrick, class of many classes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> are both uh, guys, they're, they're both younger than I am, but uh, or in case you don't know it, probably the top baseball writer in America and the top track and field writer in America, right from this class. And, I, and really, I, not from this class, from this school, and uh, I looked up to those guys. They made me better. I wanted to be like them. And I, I'm, this is the honest to God truth now. I, that, you know, I said, look at them and go, geez, I, you know, I gotta up my game here, you know. I wanted a little competitive, but also just taking a lesson. So I, I wanted to, uh, to single those guys out because they really have uh, meant something to me in my career. And the other thing before I get into the letter proper is, I, I don't know, uh, I feel so lucky to have gone to Hamilton College. Uh, it, it was a blessing that I, I, I can't, I can't begin to tell you that my brother followed me and another brother and my nephews, and uh, it, it's just the most spectacular thing, uh, probably the best thing that ever happened to me. And I think we all, you know, the Bankert family's here today. Mrs. Bankert, who I knew very well, used to have a saying, aren't we lucky? And aren't we lucky that we went to Hamilton College? I, I really and truly believe it. Um, So I have a reputation for talking too much and too fast, so I'm going to try not to talk too much, and I'm going to try to slow it down. Uh, I am honored to have been selected to present this analyst letter for the class of 1970. As I said, honored and intimidated. So many of my predecessors were men of uh, extreme distinction. I think of millionaire abolitionist Garrett Smith, class of, uh, eight, you know, 1818. You know, he was a very famous man in his day and, and a very powerful man in his day. Muckraker and Hamilton football founder Samuel Hopkins Adams, class of 1891. Professor J. Williams, class of 1954, who taught many of us. In recent years, Barry Seaman, 67, Chris Wilkinson, 68, Vince Strolley, 69. There are others whose names we might not recognize, but who are incredibly accomplished in their professions and in the world at large. These letters have been presented nearly every year since 1865. Some of them have been dry and boring. Some have been witty. Some have been hilarious. All have been valuable historical records. I'll try to live up to the best of them. And so, it was early September, early afternoon, I think, a beautiful day. We were just about to begin our junior year. It was going to be very different from the first two. Why? Because there are going to be women on the hill. <laughs> not college staff, not fraternity cooks, not faculty wives, not the occasional faculty daughter. <laughs> no, after 156 years of institutionally imposed monasticism and supposed celibate scholarship, <laughs> two or three, I guess, doubtful propositions if you include scholarship, Hamilton College was about to become, if not co-educational, at least coordinately educational. Classes soon be begin at the spanking new bunkers of Kirkland College, America's only school whose architecture was based on the Maginot Line. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember thinking that, I remember thinking that the very first day I saw those places, you know. Uh, in the orchard, they were in the orchards and fields just across the road for some of us, had not long before hunted rabbits, grouse, and deer. Bruce Cutler shot a rabbit back there uh, with Mike Small. Mike Small was an outstanding or outdoorsman. Bruce was never the same after that, but <laughs> he was never the same before that either. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> many of us didn't know what to think, although some certainly did. We arrived, 239 of us, two years before, one of the very few, uh, and. Uh, and one of the very few women we ever saw uh, close to our ages on a regular basis was the young lady who clerked at the college bookstore, then located in the basement of the Bristol Campus Center. Her name was Linda, 
And if she had a last name, I don't believe any of us ever learned it. I, I certainly didn't. Um, to show you how brilliantly creative we were, we christened her Linda College Store. Or maybe she, maybe she was already known by that name. I, I'm not quite sure. In my recollection, she was a pretty girl, maybe 22, perhaps younger. She was more alluring still, given the lack of competition. Um, she could have had a date seven nights a week. But, you know, apparently, being a woman of good taste and keen judgment with a knack for self-preservation, uh, it never happened. Nobody succeeded in getting a date. Maybe somebody claimed they did, but I don't think it ever happened. Uh, with this background, it can be seen that the creation of a women's college much closer than, say, Skidmore or Wells or Elmira was a wonderful thing for us. On one of the first days of the college's existence, that September afternoon, it was perhaps the first day, a group of us, several football players just out of practice, a few other louts of no particular persuasion, were informed that there was some kind of celebration over on the new campus. We, I mean, I mean they, they piled into an un unwashed maroon compact car, a Chevy 2 as I remember, piloted by a noted football player who would go on to a storied, or you might say notorious, career in criminal justice. There were five or six young, young men in the tiny vehicle, half dozen more hanging on the roof and, and uh, hood and trunk and whatever. So the driver, driver, unskilled at the task as he was, extremely unskilled, careened around the drive that led to the picnic area. As the vehicle approached the group of several score of young women and their professors, the occupants cheered mightily over and over again. I know how many of you guys were involved in this. It's more than just me, I know that. I, I, you know. Uh, <clears throat> As the vehicle approached a group of several score young women, their professors, the occupants cheered mightily over and over again. There were women on the hill, women of their own age. Hallelujah. That was a great thing. The cheering and celebration continued. It was more fevered and tense than might have been, had been for any great victory in football or basketball. It was really a bit over the top. Had these ladies, lads never seen a woman before? Did they not have sisters and girl cousins and mothers and aunts? Hadn't they gone to high school with girls? Well, some had not. <laughs> Me, I had five sisters, but there was a distinction between sisters and women. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is, this incident, and this is absolutely true, this incident was recorded by the New York Times in its account of the first days of Kirkland College. The future lawyer, and I'm sure you can guess his name, Bruce Cutler, um, when shown the story was mortified and fearful. Oh no, he exclaimed, that's my mother's car. She's gonna kill me. Well, she obviously did not. Um, the coming of Kirkland and its eventual absorption, absorption changed Hamilton forever, in a good way for sure, Although somebody said to me, well, in what way? Well, in one very simple way is like, some guys finally realized that women were people, you know, I mean, actual people. So <clears throat> that was good enough. Um, but you know, um, and it's true, I mean, it's true. I mean, some guys had no idea. <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> but, but you know, but say, Single uh, gender education had its charms. Uh, you haven't lived and you sit, until you sat on a case of beer in the wrecked front seat of an unheated MG all the way to Aurora, New York, as I did once with Klaus Siebert driving, on a cold January night, just to have a couple of chief drafts with a member of the opposite sex. So the arrival of squadrons of women was many, many, one of the many highlights of our Hamilton experience. There were so many others the bizarre presentation of American Nazi George Lincoln Rockwell, the making of the movie The Sterile Cuckoo, some great athletic accomplishments. Um, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon while we were here. And during our intense, nerve-wracking, divisive last couple of years, living through the assassinations of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, the first draft lottery, angry argumentation and protests over the shootings at Kent State, the bombing of Cambodia, and the Vietnam War in general. We were an odd group of young men, or maybe more accurately, a group of odd young men. 
There were preppies, upstaters, legacies, sons of immigrants, descendants of Mayflower families, um, a few Jews, a few who were first in their families to go to college, almost all white, fewer Asians, a handful of foreign students, several African Americans. There was one guy, and some of you remember this very well, others maybe have no idea. There was one guy who was remarkable for wearing just jeans and a t-shirt, even in winter, and who sometimes walked to commons barefoot, again, even in winter. He once found a deer hide that an upperclassman had left behind after skinning the animal in the Dunham bathroom, took it to his room, and slept on it. I believe he and his roommates found themselves infested with ticks the next day. <laughs> and they were, they were. He wasn't with us for, lo for long, but I do understand that he did return a few years later and graduated um, uh, a few years on. This was all attended, and when you talk about get into the faculty, I mean, my goodness. So um, this was all attended by a faculty unlike any other, or certainly unlike any you would find today. Some of these fellows, and they were all fellows except maybe one except, well, there, maybe there was one exception, I, I can't really remember, had been teaching on the hill since before the stock market crash of 1929. <laughs> and they had. Digger Graves and George Nesbitt had been on duty for four decades. There was strange and wonderful Paul Parker, whose art history class has stayed with and influenced some students more than almost anything ever taught on the hill or anything they particularly took, even if they were regarded as gut courses, supposedly not requiring a great deal of sweat. Uh, I hesitate to use this because we, we uh, this is not intended in any, but uh, Asian Ed Lee, he was not Asian, he taught Asian history, but Asian Ed Lee was one. David Spooley Ellis, you know, would give his lecture, and, and I fell asleep in one of his lectures, and I remember awakening to have, feeling his stare boring right through my chest. Um, and some people said he was boring. I didn't think so. I was just tired. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Charles Adler in his riveting Rasputin lecture, a lot of us really remember that. Well, that was uh, um, always a highlight. Um, uh, I think, uh, I don't know how many years in a row he did it, and people would come in and, and listen. Tom Colby making his way slowly across the main quad, uh, dressed in his cape storm coat, cane in hand, mustachioed, intimidatingly unsmiling. I don't remember him ever smiling. I didn't have a class with him, but I was always scared of the guy. Afraid of the guy. I shouldn't say scared. Afraid of the guy. The singular John Mattingly, crash helmeted polymath. Fierce and Yvonne Markey, master of American literature, capable of bringing a failed scholar to tears and occasionally doing so, although he sometimes provoked nervous laughter. I've told this story many times. Mr. Pitrezzi, he once told me, he, he used the Italian pronunciation, he told me after I gave a response that wasn't quite up to his standards, it is refreshing at a college such as Hamilton to meet someone as inarticulate as yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, Mark Kahn, uh, who has passed on, Mark Kahn was in class with me, he went nuts. He went after Mark, he, you know, hammer and tongue. I said, shut up, Mark, shut up. And I, I just laughed and laughed, and Yvonne Markey loved me forever after, and I got some very good marks for him, and he was a hard guy to get a, mark, a good mark from. Legendary English professor Robert Bobo Rudd, Hamilton 09, had retired by our time, but he frequently could be seen on campus wearing jodhpurs, boots, riding coat and helmet, his dog Nipper Nap, a walking rug at his side his horse presumably tethered nearby. Bobo sometimes attended fraternity parties and he was not always well behaved. <laughs> um, some of us were lucky enough to take a speech course from writer in residence Alex K. Haley, who eventually garnered great fame as the author of Roots. Alex was an amiable, amiable man, prone to bumming cigarettes and having them bum from him. His brand was Philip Morris, uh, Philip Morris Multifilters. I remember that very clearly. He, at that time, was smoking at that time, he, he bummed a lot of cigarettes for me, and I bummed quite a few from him. Um, already notable thanks to the autobiography of Malcolm X and his Playboy interviews, I think that's why some of us subscribe to the magazine, uh, he told us much of his African origin story long before it was published. Alex also was a good bet to issue A grades, A grades, for some of us the only A we would see in our four years on the hill. That's true for me. Um, I don't know about anybody else. Indeed, and I think, I think a, a lot of guys 
will find this to be true. Indeed, most of the faculty had a 25 letter alphabet. A did not exist. <laughs> they were not given to dispensing such marks or even high Bs easily. Dump trucks was the term for those stingy with grades. S excuse me, Steve Katz remembers as a freshman overhearing a senior asking English professor Edwin Barrett if he liked his 100 page thesis. There were a couple of good sentences, Barrett replied. <laughs> Apparently, it was always thus at Hamilton. The analyst for the class of 1873, for example, told the tale of the young man who was given a zero by Dr. Ellicott Evans. Do you, th do you think I deserve that, the student asked? No, Evans said, but that's the lowest mark we have. <laughs> these, these guys were cold, they were cold. Uh, in truth, we regarded our some of our teachers, a very few of our teachers, as lazy and unfair. Well, I did. I don't know about the rest of you, but I did. Uh, but they were, for the most part, distinguished scholars and demanding taskmasters who knew, even if we lamented it, that it wasn't going to be easy if it was going to be any good. They, like Jimmy Dugan in a league of their own, knew the score. It's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everybody would do it. The hard is what makes it great. Most of us, probably all of us, thought we were pretty smart when we arrived on the hill so long ago. The faculty, with its stringent old school standards, showed us that, other than a, true, a few, excuse me, few truly gifted scholars, we were not. Many of us quickly became acquainted with academic humility for the very first time in our lives. You sometimes hear that we, the Hamiltonians of long ago, could never get into the Hamilton of today. Perhaps, but that would let, have less to do with native intelligence and academic accomplishment than it would uh, for a propensity for odd, aberrant, curious, and or mindless behavior that generally stopped just short of criminality, but sometimes it. I, I could go into detail, but I won't. The movie Animal House, amateurs, didn't even scratch the surface. <laughs> And that is the truth, and everybody here knows it. Uh, for those who were church-going, big family, wet behind the ears, kids, the culture was a shock. So shocking, some of us, I mean them, some of them, <laughs> eventually participated, participated in some of the not-so-harmless activities. I don't believe anyone in class ever spent a night at jail, at least while at Hamilton College, but we, they, probably should have. Uh, so, uh, excuse me one second. Don't get me wrong, there are, there are a great number of goodly amount of straight, straight arrow, serious, play it by the book students, excuse me, who did what they were supposed to do and never got out of line. But the rest of us, I mean you guys, you, 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 know, you know the truth of what I say. Now here's something that I think, because I never hear it, when I get together with uh, my um, fellow alumni, um, I, I don't hear it mentioned much, but it was legendary at the time. Food fights and comments would serve freshmen, their dorm advisors, in, and in independence in our, day, in our day were very common. And they were sometimes real fights with occasional flip tables, flying plates, broken windows, the face portraits of distinguished alumni, and sometimes a punch or two. Do you remember the dinner rolls? The dinner rolls were like half a baseball. You could play, I mean, they, and they hit aerodynamic beyond belief. You could throw them with great velocity and accuracy, and they broke a few windows. Believe me, they did. Um, Percy, you were in on a, Percy Looney was in on a couple of those with me. Well, I, wait, it was just Percy and a couple other guys. Uh, in any case, uh, the professors knew, if we didn't, that their demands and, pro and our proper responses would all pay off in the end. And they cared sometimes perhaps more than we did. Sydney Wardover seemed to know the name, hometown, genealogy, SAT score, and uh, you know, political affiliation of every kid on campus, and he wanted you to succeed. Kevin Kennedy, now I hesitated to say this, but I, I kinda, I gotta say it, Kevin Kennedy 
One of our more creative miscreants before going on to a very successful career in finance and serving as the chairman of the college board of trustees did succeed largely because of the Elfin Wartimer. Quote, Sidney Wartimer saved me from expulsion, forced me to get my act together, wrote my business school recommendations, and was my North Star and life mentor as long as he lived. I was one of many for Sidney, Kevin said. True enough. And then there was the dean. Tie askew and pants sagging at the end of the cocktail hour. I tired in those same baggy pants and stained undershirt as he drove down the hill on Sunday mornings when he sometimes would pick up the rare early rising student headed to the village for mass maybe at St. Mary's or at St. James. I remember running beside him through knee deep snow along, the hundreds of, well, along with the hundreds of other students um, at the United County Airport to greet the hockey team ever qualified for the ECAC playoffs. He, by the way, um, Kevin Kennedy and Peter Kennedy, well, the, I'll be mentioned again later, but they were big heroes of that team. Um, and I remember they refused to bring the plane into the terminal. We had to go way up, uh, a few hundred yards up the tarmac or whatever. So they bring out the, the stairs and they put it, and here comes Greg Bott out the door and almost right down the stairs. <laughs> Because, I, according to Greggy, everybody on that plane had been er overserved on the way back. Kevin would know. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure. Um, but the dean wanted you to succeed as, succeed as well. Dean Tolls, Witten Tolls, Hamilton 28. How much rope, to me, he was just a legendary character. How much rope did you give to how many mindless rabble rousers? How many final warnings he'd hand out to the same short falling students who just couldn't get it done in the classroom? How many lost and hidden credits did he find for those coming up short as graduation approached? How many recommendations did he make, written by phone, in person, to help a guy get into graduate school? How many of us owed him big time in terms of our careers or otherwise? There was no one else anywhere like the dean, and there never will be again. But then it was a different day in so many ways. Michael Lordy remembers all his textbooks costing a total of about $50 and recalls writing to his parents to assure them that $5 a week would be an adequate allowance. I don't remember getting an allowance. Might have, I, I don't think so. Uh, really, some of us never saw $5 at any one time, but it wasn't a problem. When a small draft beer, uh, a small draft beer costs a quarter at the time, about that, I think that's right. I'm, I'm sure most will agree. Um, you, you could get through a night for two or three bucks at the rock or the shoe out on Route 5. If you had a date, it could get complicated. Uh, girls who drank beer were preferred, uh, <laughs> but the prettier the girls, the more she rated a dollar and a quarter gin and tonic or a slow gin fizz. And when I wrote slow gin fizz, I said, when was the last time I heard those words, slow gin fizz? And I think it was more than 50 years ago. It was a popular drink at the time. Uh, in any case, house parties, three of them a year were the highlights of on-campus entertainment. Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, was there Sunday morning? Yeah. But so by that time, I was shot, so I, I have no idea. Uh, each fraternity had it specially, but every party had one thing in common. Oceans of alcohol usually concerned with, uh, consumed with little care. Entertainment at the houses featured some top central New York bands, Otis and the All Night Workers, the Electric Elves, Will and the New Yorkers, and many others that I can't remember. The big show on Saturday nights, popular national acts like Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell, Sam and Dave, Mary Wells, Smokey Robinson, The Miracles, Laura Nero, Sly and the Family Stone, what, they never made it? Is that right? They never made it. The box tops, and perhaps most memorably, the four tops. How did these guys show up here? You couldn't book acts like that today at any price. It wasn't all struggling to do well academically and partying mightily to make up for it when we didn't. There was tragedy to, de to deal with. Whit Ferguson, 68, a lacrosse teammate of some of us, was killed in Vietnam. Our classmate, classmate easygoing Bob Bankert, outstanding golfer and basketball player, son of, a, son of a Hamilton graduate, was killed in an auto accident. We learned of that in the middle of a Saturday night, Parents Weekend, 1968. It was a severe kick in the teeth, and for some of us, maybe most of us, our first brush with death involving a person so close to us. We haven't forgotten it to this day. The next year, basketball coach Ken Patrick, 
the, sir, the silver fox, died right on the court, falling into the laps of several of his players early in the season opening game. Witt and Bob were gone not long out of their teams. We thought Coach Patrick was an old man. He was 63 years old when he died. How does that sound now? <laughs> By the time we graduated, with all that and a war playing out in the headlines and on TV, we repeatedly had been shocked into seeing what the real world was like. Sports, we had our successes. Hockey had a long and proud tradition and had an especially great season when we were sophomores with classmates Kevin Kennedy and Peter Kennedy playing key roles. Football had some really outstanding teams now and then. The coaching staff was presided over by the Lincoln-esque, extremely popular athletic director and unknown to us, terrific former college athlete, Max Weber. Never heard, ever heard Max Weber ever refer to his athletic accomplishments, but he was, in the 1920s, one of the most famous athletes in Ohio. And um, this is much of an aside. If you can imagine this, he played on, was a star on, the last Overland College football team to defeat Ohio State, which was in 1926. <laughs> but in any case, he never ever mentioned his athletic, and he was, a great, he was a great athlete. There was a dashing Don Jones, still Hamilton's winning his football coach by far with 97 wins. Trainer and track coach Gene Long, taskmaster of the football team's preseason workouts. Coach Patrick, aforementioned, had been a legendary athlete at Ithaca College. The mercurial swimming coach Eric McDonald, sometimes outrageous, who had a heart of gold and more than a little coaching genius. Hockey coach Greg Bott, Gre uh, by the way, Eric is still coaching lacrosse down in Fort Myers, Florida. He's, I think he turned 80 this year. Ho hockey coach Greg Bott, beyond amiable, a legendary player in his day, and still able to make his players look silly on the ice when we were in school. Soccer and lacrosse coach Manfred von Schiller, Manfred von Schiller, sometimes mocked for his supposed male props. In four years of playing for him, I, we, the guys and I were talking about this earlier, in four years of playing for him, I never actually heard him say any of the things he supposedly said. He might have, I don't know. But he was one of the toughest guys and finest people you'd ever meet. He had all the players, class by class, over to his house for dinner one year, list of lacrosse players. Apparently, Ting Ui tells me the soccer players were never invited for some reason, but. That's fine with me, but his young wife, who had come over from Germany, uh, made dinner. The experience was memorable. Platters with huge steaks falling over the edges, enormous salads, mounds of potatoes, and endless rounds of ginger ale. Ginger ale. So <clears throat> no beer. No, I, mean, well, we, I guess you could. Uh, what was it, 18 at the time? I don't know, but we weren't going to get beer. Anyway, uh, Coach Von Schiller is going to be 92 on July 31st. He's still working on his fruit farm in, in um, uh, Sotus, New York. He can't walk, but he gets up on the tractor and prunes the trees and sprays them and so on. And uh, he's just a terrific guy. I just talked to him very recently. And of course, there was Lyle Jeffers, the Sinji equipment manager. You could never get an extra shirt or pair of socks out of Lyle, but he did his job well. And if you got to know him, you discovered he was a sweetheart. I got to be friends with him, and I can assure you that he would help anyone out anytime. We were friendly till the day he died a few years ago. Aside from the early days of college football when Hamilton was ranked among the powers of the game, that's actually true, believe it or not, uh, but it was 120 years ago. Uh, <coughs> uh, 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 out, uh, and outstanding hockey and basketball teams on occasion, the athletic success on the hill was a sometime thing. It's a fact, however, that the members of the class of 1970 contributed to some truly outstanding sports teams during their time here. McDonald's swim teams, who but Eric could get fans to jam into that old pool and go wild over shaved up guys splashing water all over the place. The, the class of uh, 1970 swimmers went 35-4-1 during their time here, and they were fun to watch, a strange thing to say about swimmers. At least I thought it was a strange, you know, but... Be that as it may, that, that was very exciting, go to those meets. It really was. He, he had it cranked up. Um, numerous members of our class, who there are too many to mention, um, contributed heavily to the 1970-67 football team, which went 6-1, and one, 
was ranked sixth in the Amber Bowl, Lambert Bowl competition for small colleges, and scored an epic, highly unlikely, come from behind, way behind victory over St. Lawrence University that every team member remembers to this day. The basketball team was very competitive every year, and especially during the 68-69 season, going 15-3 for the best record in the college's history up to that time. It might be that at that team, Bob Voss was the wheel horse and won the j -Loss Award as the college's top athlete the next year, with uh, 1970s Jerry Pisnelli and Mike Grieco also playing a significant roles. Set, that set the stage, perhaps, for Hamilton becoming known as a basketball school in the coming years under Tom Murphy and being thought of that way athletically ever since. And by the way, I don't think I did this early, earlier. Because that team's so outstanding, I, I did not mention my football teammates. We know who we were. I know how, you know, some of them really were huge contributors to that team. Um, but the guys' uh, basketball team, I think the other members, Jerry Pisnelli, Bob Voss, Mike uh, Grieco, but um, I should also mention, because they had such a great team, Richie Glover, John Bow, Steve Lynette, Frank Karlinski. Did I miss anybody? Steve? Lynette? No? He's not here? Did I miss anybody? You didn't hear me. Okay, forget it. All right. Um, soccer, track, cross country all had their successes during their time, as did golf and tennis, which were really Hamilton, the signature sports at Hamilton in the 50s and 60s. Um, some of us um, had big successes as fans to the New York Jets shocking upset of the Baltimore Colts. Um, the, uh, and uh, Hamiltonians from the metropolitan area certainly enjoyed that, uh, and as well as uh, the Miracle Mets and the New York Knicks all, also winning championships. I have to tell you, it didn't mean being from the Buffalo area, um, didn't mean that much to me, but Steve Lynette said I had to put that in there. Uh, <coughs> Some Hamiltonians had, had a brush with fame, and at least one Kirklander, Sandra Faison, began a long and successful theatrical career when part of the serial cuckoo adapted from a book by Hamilton graduate John Nichols, 62, was shot on campus in 1968. Our Bob Linder was not one of them. Linder had been a, uh, in a couple of plays on campus and, like at least a few other students, was hopeful that he might somehow luck into a small role in the movie and perhaps launch a great cinematic career. He saw a chance one day when a shoot was going on near the Alexander Hamilton statue. I walked by on the fringes of the crowd, a bright red sweater my mom had given me tied around my, back, my neck, he recalled. Suddenly, Alan Pakula, who was directing his first film, stopped to shoot. He motioned over, me over to him. This is it, I thought. Welcome to Hollywood. <laughs> <clears throat> you, you, come here, Pakula said. Yes, sir, how can I help? Bob, who I remember as being always well-groomed, trim, well-dressed, and I guess handsome enough, I haven't seen him in quite a while, so I have no idea if that's still the case, um, was thinking, of course, that his future and fortune were made. However, your sweater, Pakula said, we need your sweater in this shoot. <laughs> could, could you please? Bob sighed, sure, okay. The film came out in 1969. Leonard Malton gave it three stars. My sweater never got a mention, Bob said. <laughs> there are many sterile cuckoo stories, many. That might be the best one. The biggest, the biggest story in our history on the Hill, however, was not only one that came toward the end, the war in Vietnam and the tumultuous effect it had on our lives then and forever after. The first draft lottery was held on December 1st, 1969, a day that still fills those subjected to the finger of fate with dread. Brad Townley pulled a, a nine and eventually was inducted. He almost had to go through basic training twice after failing physical, physical training, but an army clerk with a Hamilton degree from a year or two before finagled him out of it. Phil Rosbeck went to Utica and joined the Army Reserves the morning after the lottery, delaying law school for a year. Still, he somewhat resented his friend Gary Clark, who drew number 366 and was 4F with a bad new to boot. So he, Gary didn't need the 366. There had been de increasing debate on college campuses across the country reg regarding American involvement in Vietnam and the widening of the war there during our time at school. There are those who felt Hamiltonians simply didn't care about the world around them, 
but the truth was more likely that we're, there was not widespread opposition to the war for our first couple of years on the Hill. Chris Wilkinson, half-century analyst for the class of 18, 1968, reported that in November 1965, a poll showed that more than half the student body and nearly half the faculty supported the war. And this is somewhat, what is it was what someone would call scarcely credible that 26% of the faculty reportedly favored the use of nuclear weapons. The numbers would change dramatically over the next four years, especially after the U.S. bombings of Cambodia in the spring of 1970 and the Kent State shootings on May 4th of that year. I have approached this topic with a good deal of trepidation. It was a divisive issue to be sure, but we are used to such things by now. The war is an increasing matter of hot debate through our college careers. The discussion only grew in intensity as time went by and reached a crescendo in the final months of our senior year with marches and gatherings in Clinton and meeting at, upon meeting on campus. Finals were delayed or not administered. Tensions were high. Accusations were made. Principal, high principal was involved. And everyone was convinced of his or her righteousness. Not so different from today, and perhaps not so different from times before, but it might have been the most obvious indication that the nation was of two minds, and two minds that weren't going to agree on much of anything. Stu Herman remembers, after fighting environmental battles in the Utica area in preparation for the first Earth Day, April 22nd, 1970, attending strike meetings on campus and classes grinding to a halt, after the Kent State shootings, which they certainly did. And there were a certain number of uh, confrontations between students and between, in some cases, between students and faculty members, rare but it happened. Um, one upshot of this whole business was a determination by some students not to wear robes at graduation. But eventually, all but six seniors Percy Looney was one protesting what he felt was American imperialism abroad in oppressive racial policies at home. Uh, all but six seniors wore them, although the money for them, or at least part of it, was donated to the strike fund. The scars of that time are still with us. They undoubtedly never will fade away completely. I'm not sure our time was quite so different than earlier eras, even if we felt ours was special. There is plenty to worry about in the 50s, as a quick scan of any newspaper from that era will tell you. The old world was changing, as it always does. Hamilton College was changing, as it always will, Professor Williams wrote in his annus letter from the class of 1954. True, changing, but always the same in a way. For some, college is a practical matter, a way station on a path to a career, a good life, and not necessarily anything to be crawled with great emotion. I've spoken to more than one classmate who felt that way. For, for others, maybe for most, certainly for those who, have, who are here now, who have supported the college in numerous ways over more than five decades, it is something much more, something spiritual perhaps. I can't put a word on it. Friendship, hardship, memories made, egos bruised, senses sharpened, old rivalries forgotten, Again, I will steal from a previous analyst, Carl Carmer, a distinguished author and folklorist, folklorist, class of 1914. Dorothy Parker said Alexander Wolcott, class of 1909, believed he, if he were a good boy, that when he died, he would go to Hamilton College. <laughs> he did, he's buried in the cemetery, okay? Uh, and I understand they first took him to Colgate because that's where they thought, uh, well, Hamilton, you know, Colgate's in Hamilton, so. But in any case, he finally, his ashes or body finally made their way back here. It's way back here. To, uh, to use, this is, again, this is karma, to use the poetic imagery of the Indian tribes for whose education this institution was founded, not strictly true, but it's karma, we calculate that when we saunter the Milky Way, tasting strawberries that grow beside it. We will not insist on going to Hamilton College. Wherever we may go, Hamilton College, the state of mind, the remembered dwelling place of beauty, the rendezvous, rendezvous of our youthful fellowship will be going with us. 
Thank you, boys and ladies. <laughs>